And I just, me personally, if I was a fan watching the show, I would have went, oh, it would have yeah. been, and, and that was a, a Vince term. That's not good heat. That's disgusting heat. <laughs> yep. And that's one of the terms he said. And that was the kind of thing. So that was where I was against that. But I still thought the dog pound match still could have been interesting. The problem was, I think that it was a little bit of, uh, you know, just execution wise. And I'm not putting it on the guys. Yeah. I just mean just the way the whole match came together. It wasn't as well thought out, and that's as much on us as it is on anybody else. And what was your mine was on? You know, w w DX was hot at the time. Yeah. I mean, on you know, uh, uh, it was Sean Hunter in China, and I mean, they were hot. You know, and I'll never forget. You know, sitting at Vince's table and him telling me that he wanted to start these New Age Outlaws with Billy Gunn and and Jesse James. Yep. And I looked at him like, "What are you out of your mind?" Yep. I mean, I, 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 I did not see that at all. But yep. he was like, "No, nah, Vince, I'm telling you, there's something about these two guys. If we put them together, to so I was like, "All right, you know, let's do it." And I mean, sure enough. But man, the first time he threw that out at me, I, I looked at him like he had two heads. But uh, I mean, you know, by the time we put that group together, I mean, it was it was phenomenal. All right, Steve Austin, Stone Cold Steve Austin, changed. The wrestling industry because at the time the nwo in wcw was huge it was it had revolutionized wrestling there was this heel group the circumstances of the moment were just incredible wcw is so far ahead of wwe at this point it almost seems hopeless then this guy steve austin comes around they settle him with the grab bay gimmick the, the ring the ringmaster which is uh, you guys maybe can talk about this there were prefabbed gimmicks that were the result of brainstorming sessions, that, and one of them was the ringmaster, and they just applied it to Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. And all of that changed, he broke through it. Talk about the Steve Austin phenomenon, especially your impression of him and your involvement in that evolution of a character who became, next to Hulk Hogan, the most successful money-drawing wrestler in this country's history. Can I throw two cents in before you go? Because at the <laughs> let's time first, when let's first plug your book. Well, <laughs> we don't have to plug my book. Ed I Ferrara brought a book. Where did I get this at? Uh, at edferrara.com. You What's the name of the book? It's called Dark Consequences. Can you tell us a little bit? Okay. No. Okay. Uh, that's an Easter egg. You we'll see. Um, as a fan, let me just throw it out because that was right before I came in. But at the time, I was a huge wrestling fan. Uh, working indies, watching as much as I could. I had bought Prime Star Cable just so I could get ECW programming from the East Coast because I was living in Southern California at the time. Um, but uh, and, and Steve Austin was a guy who... Uh, when I was watching WCW, and this was when WCW was starting to come up, and just pre-NWO, but when they were starting to get their stuff together, and I always looked at Steve Austin, I said, this guy, at the time, the way I put it was, this guy's going to be the next Ric Flair, mm -hmm. in terms of the guy who had it, the mm -hmm. guy who had the charisma, and who could back it up, and who could go in the ring, and who could go out there and look good against anybody, make anybody look good. Um, and when Austin came into the WWE, first of all, WWF, first of all, I was ecstatic that finally, in my mind, he had made it to the show. Yeah. Um, because me being a lifelong WWF fan, growing up in the Northeast, that was all I knew, all I wanted, all I watched. And then when I saw him brought in as the ringmaster, I just held my head. I couldn't believe that they were going to blow this one. They assigned him, Ted DiBiase, to be his, his spokesperson right. because he couldn't cut a promo according right. to the powers that be at that time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. That, let, let me add a little insight yeah. to that. I, yeah. I, I was, I never saw Austin at ECW. I mean, I didn't, mm -hmm. but I was, I, I like, ECW? I saw him at, I was a Sunny okay. Steve Austin fan. And you, you mm -hmm. were in WWF when Austin was yes. first there. Let's yes, set and, that and I was a, uh, I was a stunning Steve Austin fan with the long blonde hair. I, I always liked him, you know? And I'll never forget, you know, at the time before I started really writing the television, I would write a lot of promos for the guys. So I would go to Vince and I would say, you know, Vince, you know, what do you want this character to be or what do you want that character to be to get a feel for how to write the promos. And I'll never forget when, uh, you know, Austin started as the ringmaster. The first time I heard the ringmaster, and, and I'm not even lying to you, <laughs> I thought it was a cir circus gimmick. I, I yes. didn't even well, get... that's what you said. I, I was expecting him to come out with the top I didn't get the ring... I didn't no, no, get no, no, that. No, no, I'm, no, I'm no, thinking no. that, really. I mean, the first time it was told to me, I'm like, you know... I was thinking but anyway, the Spider-Man villain, yeah, the ringmaster. Yeah, but anyway, I, I remember saying to Vince, you know, Vince, what, what, what do you want me to do for, for Steve Austin's character? Yeah. And I remember him looking me dead in the eye and him <coughs> saying to me, Vince, he, he, he's never to speak 
And if he does, <laughs> he's only to speak in a monotone. Okay? So now the thing was, I had to go to the next TV and work with Austin. Yeah. And, I, and I had to tell him this. I, you know, I said, you know, Steve, this is what Vince wants. And, you know, I got to be honest with you, at that moment, you know, he was bursting at the seams because inside was Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. But he did it. I, I mean, he was a professional, and, and as wrong as it felt, he did it. But I'll never forget the, the, the first breakthrough, and I mean, I'll never forget it was, you know, it was, just, it was just another Raw. It was no big deal, but we put Austin on headsets. Mm -hmm. And the minute he put on those headsets and I listened to him, I was like, that's it, man. I mean, that is it. You know, the and, and I remember, you know, him walking through the curtain. And, yep. you know, he, at that point, it was always, how'd I do, Vince? How'd I do? How'd I do? And I just looked at him. I said, Steve, that's it. I mean, yep. you know, th that's all you needed because was his, that opportunity. His confidence was shot at this point. Absolutely. In WCW, yeah. right. he was the Hollywood Blondes with Brian Pillman. Right. They were a hot act. Steve Austin, as U.S. champion, was cutting really good promos. And nobody who mattered, who had power, was taking notice because of the, the politics and the power structure. Right. He wasn't elevated by Dusty Rhodes. He was right. kept down. Right. Then he gets fired by Bischoff in right. one of the most infamous moves by a leader ever because he wasn't marketable. Quote from Eric Bischoff, he wasn't right. marketable. Then he goes to ECW, and he's so mad. There's so much anger pent right. up. He goes nuts, and he starts doing these imitations, and he starts He was one of the first guys to do the Hogan, one of the first one of the boys to do a Hogan impression. He did Hogan, and he yep. did Bischoff, and those were yep. the two powers that he felt held him back. That got, that just inspired him, and he got his confidence back, and people are praising him who were ECW fans, and then all of a sudden he goes to the WWF, and did Vince McMahon not see this? Did he not, l had he not seen the footage? Let me, let me make one thing. For, first of all, people don't understand this. Yes. Vince never watched ECW. Yep. V Vince couldn't tell you one single person in ECW, never watched it. <coughs> but let me tell you this when it comes to Steve Austin, okay? Credit goes to nobody but Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. And Paul Heyman Period. would be the first to say that. Mm -hmm. All we did was put him in right situations. Yeah, okay. right. But I am telling you, he was professional. He, do, he, he did exactly what Vince wanted, but when he was given that one opportunity, he ran there, with there, it. there is nobody to give credit, not Vince, not me, yeah. nobody but Steve Austin. Now, the headset thing, how long was that before the King of the Ring, Austin 316, is born? Speaking? Probably about three weeks to a month. Mm -hmm. Now. How planned out, to the best of your knowledge, was, was uh, the bro, speech? Bro, I, I got to be Talk honest about with the T-shirt. Well, I, I'll tell you about a couple things. Yeah. I, were you there for this? No, that okay, was right before they, me. They, they, these are some good stories, though, and I hate to do all the talking in it, but oh, they, that's they're okay. good I'm stories. Used to it. You know, I'll plug <laughs> your book again. Okay, plug your book again. But Maybe there's I'll a couple of things here. I'll never forget the Night of King of the Ring. Okay, Ed wasn't there. So as far as promos and everything went, I was doing everything. Okay, and... Ed can tell you, I always work with tunnel vision. I got tunnel, if, if I'm working on something, it's tunnel vision, it's tunnel vision, it's tunnel vision. So I remember Austin coming up to me and saying, Vince, I want to run this promo by you. So I said, okay, Austin, but I was saying, Steve, but I was thinking about something else. Yeah. And he's giving me the promo, giving me the promo, and in the promo I hear Austin 316. Yeah. And, and I'm, I got tunnel vision, I'm doing something else, yeah. you know? So, you know, he went out there and he cut the promo, and it was, we'll get into the rock in a minute, but as soon as I heard Austin 316's... Now, did Vince McMahon and did you... Wait a minute. No. Let, okay, let, okay. Let, 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 story. Okay. You'll, you'll get a kick gotcha. out of this. You'll get a kick out of this. As soon as he said, I'm, you know, Austin 316 says, I just, you know... I just said, that's it, man. Yeah. That is it. Okay? I ran back to Titan Tower on Monday. Okay? And I remember the Raw magazine. We were like in the second or third issue. I immediately got a picture of Austin for the cover, black and white, grainy, and we highlighted the blood. And the headline was Austin 316, because I knew, I knew. And you know, at that time, Vince had approved all the covers. Mm -hmm. So I took this, I was so excited about it, I ran over at the television studio where it was, and I showed him, and he stopped, and he goes, Vince, what's this Austin 316? And I was like, Vince, oh. wait, no, I was like, Vince, did, did you not hear the promo yesterday? I said, Vince, this is it. Yeah. Th this is gold. And this is Monday afternoon, though, just the next day? Uh, well, or, either or the next day, a couple day, days probably. after, yeah. you know, a couple days after. I, I, see, yeah, I said, they Vince, this is it, you know? And he looked at me, he says, Vince, I don't get it, I don't like it, take it off. 
Did, did did Austin no, did he get permission to do a post match promo as Jake Roberts was walking to the back, or did he almost improvise that when he went? Jake's walk, he beats Jake, or whatever happened. He's walk, Jake's walking to the back. Austin goes up and just takes over the show, basically. Was that part of the, Were you aware that he was actually going to cut a post match promo? Yes, I was. Okay, so yeah. that that yes. that because yes. he had run over yes. the promo beforehand yes. with him. But it was. I mean, it just it it just blew me away because you know, like Steve I said, when 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 the words came out of his mouth, it. I, I knew. I mean, I, I, the T-shirts, the slogan. I mean, I, I knew it was gold, and Vince I, I, still wasn't getting it. Because I, I, I have to confess something. Because Steve Austin, and I've never said this before, and I don't think he'd care now. When he was in, his, right when he went to ECW, he was out of WCW. He was frustrated. I did a long interview with him. It was in one of the Pro Wrestling Torture books, and we kept in touch a little bit. And it was a couple days before King of the Ring. He's on the phone with me, and I've got my notes at home. I keep every note I have, and I've got it. And someday, if I can have his permission, I'm going to go and take my chicken scratch notes out. And he's telling me his plans. Austin 316, he's brainstorming it with me on yeah, the phone, yeah. saying, Vince won't let me talk, yeah. but I want to talk, and I've got this plan. Yeah. And I'm going to go out there, and he starts telling me how I don't care if they approve it or not, this is what I'm going to do with the pay-per-view. And his plan was, whether he got approval or not, he was going to do it. And apparently he tried to get approval, right. and it was like, go for it. And I just remember thinking, because, I mean, I was a cheerleader for him because I knew what he could do. Yeah. And, and I and in his mind, he's like, I have to grab it. I have That's to take it, it exactly. myself. Exactly. That's it. That's, and yep. nobody gave it. I mean, I don't want to say nobody gave it to him because Vince did give him the air time. Yep. But, I mean, you talk about a guy that grabbed it. He knew he went from having no confidence in WCW, even though he was doing good work, right. to having fun in ECW, not knowing it's my future in Japan. Right. Where you don't talk, there's no promos. He was trying to decide, should I go to ECW or Japan because WWF's not returning my calls? Right. Finally, he goes mm -hmm. to ECW, then he gets to WWF. They won't let him talk. He's even more frustrated, but he's confident. And then he comes up with it, and it changed the business. And that was a case where Vince McMahon doesn't get credit for it, and you're not taking credit no, for it. No, That's no. something that happened. Yeah. It just happened. Yeah. But, now, but you got to understand he was smart enough to pull it off. Yes. Not not everybody can pull that off. Yep. That conversation he had with you, yep. he knew exactly what he was going to do, right. yep. when he was going to do it, and nobody was going to keep him down. Yep. So, I mean, he, he, he was smart enough to be able to pull that off. Yep. Well, it's also it's a perfect example of what we hear so frequently about how, you know, when you have the, the, the boys talking about, uh, I, I didn't get a push, he's getting a push, I'm not getting uh -huh. a push. And it's just, you know, it's and it's true that, you know, the, the, in the wrestling business today, it's not about getting a push. People don't get pushes. They get opportunities. Yep. And if they take the ball, run with it, and deliver, yep. they will get more opportunities. If they don't, if they fumble, yep. if they drop the ball, if they end up dropping it and kicking it you know, for 10 years, they're not going to get more opportunities. And Austin, Austin was, was a right. guy yep. who took that ball, ran it across Ran it, ran it in for the touchdown, and that was it. And he didn't think he had anything to lose at this point. He knew he could do he more didn't than have he was anything being given to the lose. opportunity to, to because that gimmick was saddled on him. It was one of those stereotypes, and he had to break that mold, and he did. And that glass yeah. breaking, it's just it's so apropos to what he did. Mm -hmm. Now, once Austin 316 takes off, fans made it a phenomenon. They're bringing signs, Austin 316. Mm -hmm. It clicks because, you know, Jake Roberts deserves credit for this because mm -hmm. Austin was, you know, he was a heel, but fans were cheering him, and Austin called out Jake on what he felt was, you know, uh, using Bible terminology in a way that he felt was twisted and not genuine, whatever, and he went with it. And then there were some, s s people might have been sensitive to it. Was there any concern at that point, at that moment, about using something from the Bible in that kind of a hardcore, edgy way? Was that a concern that I'll was brought you up? No, I mean, no. I mean, no. Yeah. It's just, you know, I, I Jerry Jarrett was offended by it. He told me that. Yeah, you know, I mean, he was like, that's that's blasphemous. It was his word to me about that gimmick, that phrase. Um, again, it's it was listening to the people. Yeah. And like you said, w w once they started with the songs, yeah. they want it. We're gonna give it to them. Yeah. I mean, and that that's really what it came down to. And it was a matter of still, but also not giving in to immediate gratification and giving it to them all at once, right. because that was when the audience was really starting to respond. That was that was the moment that really marked. Even though, for for from your perspective, from Vince's perspective. The, uh, the moment that put Austin on the map was when he put the headsets on for the first time. Yep. For the fans, that promo at the end of King of Ring, and, ri and winning King of the Ring is what put him on the map. And then what solidified it was, it was either the next pay-per-view or two pay-per-views later when he had the match with Brett. And in the, one, in the course of one match, and I remember watching this as a fan and just completely being blown away by the psychology, because also I was wrestling at the time and I was very much into the psychology, in one match, Essentially, turning Brett heel and turning Austin face yep. in one match, which was to me 
perfection but, as far as execution. But I also think, I mean, we have to call a spade a spade. And, I mean, I, I'm convinced, I mean, and as, as over as Austin 316 was and, you know, I mean, for everything he was and he represented, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to say he would have never, ever, you know, reached the, 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 the movie star sat, status that he did without the Vince McMahon character. Yes, yes, I mean, yes. I, you've got to have a great foil. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. He he would have he would have hit a certain level, but without that character to play off. Hands and, down. and you know, let, let me tell you something. That that's what people don't understand. You had two of the best in the history of this business, yep. working an angle based on reality. Yep. The blue collar worker, the white collar boss, yep. that that affected and touched every. I don't care how long we're alive. I don't care how long the wrestling business exists. You will never, ever, ever see chemistry like that again. And you'll it, never it see pops happen. in the crowd at that level. If you watch the never. Monday Night War DVD never. and you see that footage and you compare it to what you see now uh, for the most popular babyface. Out never there. happened. The, no. in, the intensity of emotion <laughs> and feeling and bond that those fans had with Austin when that glass broke and he came to the ring and he just had a way about him. But the thing is, it too, we, which we got, we, we've got to, you know, you've got to give credit was Vince in his role was every bit as good as yep. Austin was in his. And, and part of what made that work is that Vince, it was such, it's where the Hogan turn came out of nowhere in WCW. The Vince turn, not that it came out of nowhere, but there was such a multi-decade history well, of because him the being fans the street man. The fans knew him. He had been around forever. They knew him. They felt like they knew him. And also, as a fan, you knew he was the owner of the company. Yep. But yet, this was the first time that was being used yep. in the story. But lines. you know what, too, you got to give Vince credit for? And very few are able to do this. And, and every time I see not only a wrestler do it, but every time I see, you know, an actress do it or an actor do it, I mean, I'm, I'm really. I'm really taken by them. I'm, I'm really taken by people or actors and act actresses that are able to laugh at themselves. Yep. Now, the thing that amazed me here was Vince McMahon probably has w one of the top three biggest egos on this planet. It's probably <laughs> Vince, Donald Trump, and uh, throw whoever you want in there as a third. The Take guy's got a huge ego, yeah. you know, the body and, you know, the whole nine yards. But the bottom line was for business purposes, for show purposes, for all the right reasons, he goes out in the rain, he wets his pants. And gets yeah. just humiliated. Yeah. Yep. Now, you see, you, you've got to give him all the credit in the world for that because, you know, he, he was smart enough to realize what he had to do, yeah. you know, in order to make this thing go that through the That also ceiling, comes, you know? to, that comes to, a lot of that is him being in this business as long, being this business for as long as he had been, knowing how to be an effective heel and how to show your ass as a heel, yep. but still keep your heat. Mm -hmm. And that Vince was, there was never anybody better about that because Vince could show his ass one week and then the following week have ten times more heat on himself. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's something Ric Flair was great at too. Yes, in his day, absolutely. Ric Flair would get humiliated. The term show your ass, it means mm -hmm. humiliate yourself so the fans laugh yeah. at you. Yes. And then the next show, you are back on top of the world and you're pretending that didn't happen and the fans are so angry because they thought they finally got to you and they didn't. You're still on top of the mountain. Flair did that. Vince did that. Good heels do that. Yep. And, and you're right. He was so good at that. What, what was Austin like behind the scenes working with him during the whole stretch? Did he change as he got famous? Um, as he was injured? Did that change his whole persona? Was he a likable person behind the scenes? Talk about Austin, the person. Okay. Austin behind the scenes. Um... Well, you knew him earlier than I did. I came in, the uh, the King of the Ring, I came in one year to the day after he won the King of the Ring, and that was the beginning of the whole the whole McMahon-Austin storyline building up. Because that was, that was a gradual progression because it didn't become Austin McMahon right off the bat. So um, maybe you can speak to what he was like from the beginning. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because the day he won the title, we were at the, the television the next day, and, and I remember Vince saying to me, you're with Austin 24-7. I, I don't care about anybody else. You stay with him 24-7. And, and I remember... Was this the, the WrestleMania? When, when he won the title? No, I remember, he lost WrestleMania. He lost with, the, that with, with Tyson? When, oh, no. But when he, yeah, when he lost to Bret Hart, that was when he became a star. And he right. became a big star by losing, which is yeah. great. Right. But then when he won the title, then you're saying yeah. Vince knew he had it. That was it. Vince said, Vince, nobody else. You know, yeah. it's all about Austin, all about Austin, all about Austin. Stay with him, stay with him, stay with him. And the one thing I saw a as time progressed that was sad, okay? And, and, and I'll be honest with you, this is not... 
This is not a reflection on Steve. This is a reflection, I think, on how any human being would have reacted under those circumstances, also including the myself and the business. But what happened was the success with the Stone Cold Steve Austin character came so fast <clears throat> and so hard and so overwhelming. And, and keeping in mind the picture you painted leading up to that, getting fired at WCW, EC, the whole progression, now the success came so fast and so furious that, in, this is only my opinion in working with them, a, a, a certain amount of paranoia set in. Mm -hmm. And I think that paranoia set in because Steve was scared to death that this can end just as quickly as it began. And because... There was a reason to be paranoid because Vince McMahon had a history of trying to make sure nobody got too much power because he had been burned before. And Austin <coughs> felt, and probably to a certain extent it was true, there were forces working against him because he had too much power, be it other wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And even Vince just tried to keep him in check a little bit. There was a big boss man, something with boss man that happened once on TV where Austin felt it was done to put him in a bad position to show, see the production people have the power to make you look good or bad. And that's where I think he started so much was going on that he felt, you know what, there are forces working against me. Plus, too, it was also coming today. from the WCW backstage, which yep. I'm sure we'll get to, but which was very different from the WWF right. locker but room. But you know what, I also got to be honest here, and you know, <coughs> excuse me, maybe I'm naive, maybe I, I wasn't, but I, I've got to be honest with you, in working that closely to the situation, I, I never saw Vince portray that. Yeah. I mean, I, I never, I, I've seen Vince do that with other people, yeah. but I mean, with Austin, it was the pedal was to the metal man yep. and I mean he I I, 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 I I don't think Vince was concerned I mean it was yep. money yep. it was money and he knew it was money and he knew it was on the right track and you know we were going to the moon with this thing but unfortunately like I said I, I think there was just this feeling of it could all end tomorrow yep. so you could see as the weeks grew by as his popularity was growing he became more and more paranoid whereas now you're trying to write a you're trying to write a promo you're trying to write a storyline. You're trying to put him, and it was very difficult because you're always trying to put him in a unique situation. Yeah, trying but, to do something new but, every but, time but so it now, didn't get yeah, stale. But now he was looking at it like, is this going to hurt me? Or, yeah. Are they trying to hurt me? And, and it almost got to the point that he would poke holes in things until he found, finally found something. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. he wasn't satisfied until he found something. Did, did he and, do this respectfully, or was it to the point where he had so much power it was almost difficult to work with him or was it he's paranoid but polite paranoid but polite okay mm -hmm. he, he I, I, I steve was never difficult to work with i yep. mean he I, I i he was never difficult to work with but the, the paranoia became a problem because yep. you know i mean i know me personally every week i was trying to put him in different unique situations and really you know rattling my brain to come up with that but he was always just so defensive and always trying to think that i was working the other way you know, and, and, and after a while, you know, that, that, that just became a little difficult. And how was Steve with other wrestlers? Was he well-liked? Was he one of the boys, so to speak, playing pool and yeah. popular? Or did he separate himself and kind of go off to the side? It's interesting because there were, there, were, there were aspects of Steve's personality where he kept to himself. Yeah. Um, but as far in general, he was one of the boys. He loved hanging around, laughing with the guys pulling ribs, just having a good time in general backstage. But you could see the more that that, you know, the again, weight in my fame. opinion, the weight of the fame and the paranoia that, that it seemed to be kind of took hold in him. He kind of, you know, he still was one of the boys, but yet he spent more time by himself because yeah. he spent more time trying to figure out, well, what am I doing? What do I need to do? Am I doing the right thing? And going with what Vince was saying before, Again, a lot of what he came to to to, to have problems with was, uh, you know, because again, we were trying every week to do something bigger, better, fresher, newer, because that was the whole thing about Steve's character. Was, I, let let it me was just so interrupt new. for a second because I'll give you the perfect example. While I it just said this, and this is a perfect example. I'll never forget, and I don't know if you were there or not, where we, I, I came up with the idea, and I don't think you were there because I just I, I think I came up with the idea. But when he drove in the beer truck. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll never no, forget. I was there. Oh, were you there? But oh, dude, I, I'll never you're gonna forget. You're going to interrupt me and then I'm say sorry, I wasn't bro. there? I'm sorry. You're going to interrupt but me. No, but here's the deal. I'll never forget when, when we came up with him driving in the beer truck. Yeah. Yeah. And Ed and I are trying to figure out the logistics of this thing. I'll never forget. I was so excited to bring this to him. Steve, you're going to drive a beer truck. Yeah. I'll never forget. I, I, I laid this out to him and I, I was so excited about it. And he looked at me and he said to me, why can't I just drive in my pickup? And I, but that's and this what I mean. After we had done the Zamboni. Right, that, that's what yeah. I mean. I was like, Steve, a, a beer truck. Yeah. I mean, you know, but see, that's what I mean. It, yeah. it, it would get to the point of, you know, him kind of looking at us in the corner of his eye, okay, what, what are these guys trying to do here? Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, and, and that was really sad because we were on his side, you know? Yeah. Well, the thing is, the more, yeah. that, the more that we did with him, the, be the, the better that the show did. Right. The more interesting right. stuff yeah. we did, the better the show did. So, I mean, that was, it was a shame that we had to have those problems to do it, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it seemed to work out okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think people know who he is. Yeah. Then, since you've been out of WWF, as soon, and when you were gone, a lot of people have said, wasn't that influential. One of the things that they hear is scripting of interviews. And there's been different points of view on how much word for word or talking point for talking point, ideas were presented to Steve Austin, to The Rock, to some of the wrestlers. Was there a difference? Were undercard guys scripted almost word for word? Were top guys given more leeway? How did that work? What is the, the, the truth on how that scripting worked out? It, it just depends on the individual. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, that, that's really what it came down to. You, you work so much with this talent, you knew who could do what. Yeah. And, you know, a lot, a lot of it was, um, you know, some guys became, you know, started with heavy scripting. And then, you know, you kind of wean them off it. Okay. Some guys needed a lot of scripting at the beginning just because of the character, like Goldust or Val Venus. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we had to script that to create the character. Yep. But th that really is more of, a, of, of the, uh, the personality that you're dealing Plus with. Plus also, some guys pr preferred it. Right, like, right. Like Jeff. Right. Jeff Jarrett oh, yeah. was to a guy, day, to that. this day, yeah. Jeff Jarrett was a guy who he wants you to write it out, and he goes off, and I don't know how he does it, but incredibly quickly memorizes it word for word, okay. and he delivers it. And but there are other guys like Austin who would just want he would say, "What are my bullet points? Yep. What are my bullet points?" And he would make sure, and he would he would nail them. But a lot of that too, a lot of that was real important at the beginning when you're when you're um, defining the character. character. Like okay. I mean, I I remember when uh when a uh, Triple H was just starting with DX. I mean, I probably wrote every word that came out of his mouth yeah. because it's just vital at the beginning stages. But, you know, week by week by week by week, as they get into the character, you, you know, they wean off of it. Besides Steve Austin, The Rock was probably, if you had to pick two people out, without question, the other person who contributed to WWE being so hot for that stretch of time in the late 90s. Talk about the, form, the beginning of Rock. He's in the Nation of Domination group of wrestlers and everyone's kind of noticing there's something special about him even though as a baby face as a good guy he was booed by fans and people were saying he's never going to be anything he's too smiley and happy he gets an nod he gets an attitude and he starts getting noticed how did he end up being pulled aside and getting a push as a top star who noticed it how did that happen listening to the crowds yeah. the crowds were responding to yeah. him well you know the thing is um that that was another deal where um uh you were you there at the very beginning? Not the baby face. I came in NOD, and that was it, it, when that we that was another it. thing where you know uh, <clears throat> he was rocking my via. It, yep. it, it was horrible. With a that was a, and that was a perfect example right. of they'll eat what we feed them. They'll eat what yep. we feed them. He he got hurt, and then um, you know I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. You know I was writing the TV at the time, and and Bruce Pritchard actually said to me. Um, when Rock gets healthy, and you know, why don't we put him in the Nation of Domination, mm -hmm. NOD? And, and and I mean, I didn't see it, you know. And I, he put, we had nothing to lose. Yeah. I was like, well, what the heck, you know? We, we, he was getting healthy. We had to find a spot for him. Yep. So we put him, you know, went with the Nation of Domination, and of course, um, uh, Farouk, uh, you know, was was the main character at the time. And I just remember, just <laughs> watching Rock in the background. And watching his eyes and watching his mannerisms, and again, he stole the scene. Yes, the, it's the Steve Austin song. Yep, yep. it's it, the, the same thing, you know. And people started reacting, people started reacting, and I'll never forget this. As I'm watching him, I, I keep 
from somewhere, I was getting this vision of the rock in the third person, the rock this, the rock that, the rock this. But what kept me from going anywhere with it was I was a huge Don Morocco fan. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I kept thinking that this is it, it's too disrespectful to Don Morocco. Who was known as Don the, the Rock. The Rock. Morocco. You know, and that's all I could think about. But finally, you know, I, I'll never forget it. It was we, we were at Monday Night Raw and, and I went up to him, you know, and at that time it was Dwayne. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, Dwayne, I said, th th there's just something that's with me and, and, and I want to share this with you. And, I, and he goes, what? I said, why don't you just try to go out there and refer to yourself as the, in the third person? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, everything you say, it's the rock says this, the rock says that, the rock said the rock, the rock, the rock, the rock. And he just looked at me, he goes, okay, I'll try it. And yeah. it was, he, I mean, he literally was going out in, in, in a half an hour. Yeah. So, you know, it's again, it's a Steve Austin moment. He went out there and started referring to himself as The Rock. And I'm sitting in the back and I'm saying... It, <laughs> yep, I remember seeing the same thing and thinking the same thing. I, I, I'm telling, but but again, let's yep. make one thing perfectly clear, okay? It was all him. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yep. they, you, I, I could have said those words to 50 other guys. Yep. It was all him. And, and let me tell you the one thing about The Rock where I, I've said this and I'll, I'll say it again. I don't think there's going to be another star in the history of this business that is bigger than The Rock. And the reason being, in my opinion, the thing that was so much different about him, you know, people have charisma, people have good looks, people have all these things. Yep. But the thing that was different about him was he was so much smarter than everybody else. Mm -hmm. He had he had such an intelligence yep. level, nobody could touch him. I mean, the conversations I used to have with him and what was going through his mind, he was just so much smarter than everybody else. And that's why I believe you're never going to find another individual that has just all those gifts and is able to take all these gifts and just you know go out and and do what he does and it's just another scenario like Austin man all the credit goes to him yeah. because he was smart enough to be able to pull it off. Ed was there a downside to working with Rock? Did he get a big head? Was he ever full of himself? Did he ever go I am smarter than everyone else and kind of take on an air of superiority around people? Actually, uh, no, and it's without hesitation. I yep. say that Rock is, I mean, because I think, I believe, because of that intelligence, yep. that fierce intelligence that he had, and he would analyze everything, but not in, a, in like the way that we talked about with Steve. Yeah. He would analyze everything and try and see how to improve it. What yeah. can I add to it as opposed to what was very but, but the difference between the two, yep. and again, a lot of it had to do with how they got there. The difference between the two was the confidence. Mm. Rock, Rock knew he was better than everybody right. else. Yep. He, he didn't and care he, about politics. He, he knew he, he hadn't was been let go from WCW. Else. That's right. He had, right. you know, right. he had been. He, yep. But he did have a lame gimmick slapped he on. Got, him. Yeah, right. he went through from day one. one. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, Rock also supremely he confident. Had, he yes. was very confident, yes. but not arrogant. No, yep. and no, not no, cocky. No, never, Just no. confident, sure of himself. And I mean, he was always so easy to work with. He was such a pleasure to work with because it was literally working together and working, you know, with him to get the best we could out of him. Is it safe to say you looked forward to working with Rock more than Austin just because it was more of a It was it was less of a tug of war. Okay. Yeah. There, with Austin, it was always it was always ultimately at the end of the day it was all for the best, you know, in the in the best interest of the product. Yeah. And Austin like like Vince said, polite Yet he could be very stubborn, and it was like a tug, yeah. tug the, of war. The, the but Rock, right? The frustration it was a lot with easier. Steve was, Steve, we're not trying to hurt you. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're on your team. We yeah. want to get this to the next level, and, and and that was the frustration. But you know, again, to me, the amazing thing with Rock was um, the whole time. You know, from Rocky My V or at Madison Square Garden to the last day I left. It was the same guy, man. Yeah. It yeah. was not the same one guy, yeah. was and he was respectful with everybody right. yeah. from right. top to bottom. Yeah. And, and was Austin respectful of the little guy behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, yeah. he, he yeah. very much yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, when you think of a guy at the level, I mean, because even, especially now, at this point, with The Rock's career blowing up in Hollywood yeah. and all that, he's gone even further <clears throat> than Steve did. Yeah. And But there was no, not even the slightest inkling of that. How did Steve and Rock get along? Was there professional jealousy? Was there respect? Did they hit it off personally? Did they keep their distance? What was going on between them? Because Austin was first, mm -hmm. and then Rock comes along, 
and Austin's no longer Hulk Hogan and then everybody else. Now it's Austin and Rock and everybody else. How did that, how did that work? I, I, I think, it, and, and again, this is just my opinion, I, I think there might have been a touch of jealousy on Austin's part, but it never affected his no. professionalism yeah. at all. Yeah. Never. Never. I'm not doing the job. Never. Because I'm not. Never. Austin had what Hogan didn't have, right. which was a Larry Bird or the Magic Johnson. Right. That, mm -hmm. And that, I think, helped both of them. And as much as maybe they each might, might have rather been in Hogan's spot, it's Hogan and everybody else, in a sense, they also had to appreciate that they had each other to work but off it, of. But again, yeah. uh, with, with Austin, too, Austin was smart enough, and, and, and Ed kind of just hit, hit on him. He was the same to everybody from top to bottom, and him working with Rock was business, and it would make him more money. Right. And, and, and he Steve, knew that. Steve was always smart enough to know that. He yep. would do whatever was right for business, including the Shawn Michaels match. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a catastrophe, but business. And, and I mean, Steve always was business. He always was. What, talk about the catastrophe. What was a catastrophe? Oh, boy, man. I could tell you stories till 3 o'clock in the morning, man. It's <laughs> at, at the time of the Austin and, and Sean match, Vince and Sean were not talking. And I was the middleman. Yeah. And I used to get from Sean, go tell Vince this, go tell Vince that, go tell Vince this. And at the time, poor Hunter was stuck in the middle of it mm -hmm. because he was part of DX. But man, at, at that time, you know, Sean was at just such a bad place, man. Yeah. And he'd be the first one to tell you yeah. today. It's all on record. He's there's talking no, about no, no yeah. question Upsets about it. But he was at such a bad place. But there's one thing I want to say is we, we talk about Austin and we talk about Rock. And, you know, I, I've talked about this in my book. To me, the most talented performer I ever worked with was Shawn Michaels. O overall or in the ring? Or overall. Every, every, overall. Yep. Because Shawn didn't have the gifts of rock. Yep. He didn't have the gifts rock had. But when it came to being a star, yep. I mean to this day I, I, I'll still say he was the he, you know, he, he was the biggest star that, that, that I ever worked with. And, and I had such a a love-hate relationship with Sean. I mean, I, th that's a guy that I wrote a lot of his stuff. Yeah. And, you know, he would come to me a lot, but it, a lot of it was love and hate. A, a lot of it, I mean, and, and I'm sure he'd be the first to say it, you know, there were some drugs involved, yep. so you weren't always, you know, working with... You the, didn't know what Sean would show up. You didn't know what yeah. Sean would yeah. show up. But, I mean, as far as talent, I mean, I, I just, to this day, I think the guy's incredible. Now, DX... Triple H, the rise of Triple H. He's this third element in the boom period of WWF. Mm -hmm. Steve Austin and The Rock, mutual respect. They became big stars at about the same time. You know, I mean, there's, you know, Austin first. But then Hunter's trying to figure out where do I fit in. You've got Austin with his injuries. You've got Rock with a movie career that gave Hunter some options. What was Hunter like in the formative stages? And did he seem driven to be one of the top guys? Was he just happy to be a, a second tier guy who got lucked into a top spot? What was he like early on? Because now we know he's the top dog, but what was he like when Rock and Austin were around? He was absolutely driven. Yeah. I mean, Hunter, Hunter, but again, Hunter was one of the hardest working guys in that company. Hunter knew that Austin was here and Rock was here and Hunter was here. And Hunter knew that he wanted to be there and he knew that one day he would be there. But he was not, you know, he didn't rest for a second. He was tireless. And he, again, I would put him more in the Austin camp in terms of just poking, poking holes at everything and looking, scrutinizing everything. Because, again, he was looking at it as, I'm not there and I don't want the slightest misstep. Yep. to keep me from getting there a second later than I should be get than I should be arriving. Yep. Um, and they both he was hungry. He yep. was he was rabid hungry <laughs> and he was great to work with because he if he took something he would run with it and make it gold. The thing about the thing about uh, Hunter and, and 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 you know I I've said this before is you know I I got two small boys and and if I if I ever wanted to teach them a lesson on just you know, dedication and hard work. Hunter would definitely be the example, and and it, it, the reason why I'm jumping in is because you weren't here for this. But mm -hmm. you know when the you sure the, the, <laughs> yes, the last you, time you know when, I when, was. when I'll never forget when the tragedy went down at Madison Square Garden. Okay, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. The right? curtain call. The curtain call, and I'll never forget. I, I was, was there. 
Which which is no, it really wasn't. Which no, it which, wasn't. which it should be noted is how Steve Austin got his break. Triple H talks about that in the book, yes. where Hunter was scheduled to win the King of the Ring. Right. He screwed up. But Austin gets w- a w- Which is my point. I'll yeah. never forget. Uh, you know, I went to the booking meeting the next day. This is when I was the odd man out, mm-hmm. and man, it, it 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 was like somebody shot somebody's grandmother. <laughs> I mean, it was like it was and the end I, of the world. I was so entertained <laughs> by they thought the business was dead. Yep. It, it, from this day because forward, of MSG is a center of Vince McMahon's yeah, universe. Yes. It always yeah. will be. But man, I'll never forget it. And let, let's let let let's think about the consequences. Sean at the time was the champion. Yep. Not okay. Do to him. Hall and Nash were on their way out. Mm-hmm. There was one guy. Yep. And when I tell you, I was there firsthand when they tortured him. Mm-hmm. They absolutely. And I remember going in in locker rooms when he'd be by himself, and I'd say, Hunter, hang in there. You've got to hang in there. You 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 know the game. Mm-hmm. You know what they're going to do. You got to hang in there. And they tortured him, and they buried him, and they beat him, and they tortured him some more. The the, the wrestling games yep. that I hate so much that made Steve that have historically been done, yes. and is where Steve Austin is coming from. Yes, even though he it maybe mm-hmm. wasn't happening as much as he thought. Yes. the Hunter example yes. shows where Austin got that paranoia from. But right? you talk about a guy rising above it mm-hmm. all. You know what? It, it, it personally hurts me. When I, I hear people talk about Triple H today, and I, I haven't spoken to Hunter since I left, yeah. but it personally hurts me when I hear it because I worked with the guy for almost three years. Mm-hmm. And and I, I don't believe for one minute that the Hunter today is the guy that people are telling me is. If anything's changed Hunter, it's the business. Mm-hmm. It's not Hunter because when you talk about heart, n- nobody could touch him. I mean, no nobody could touch him. Speaking of heart, that's a lame transition. Bret Hart, Survivor Series. We've got to talk about that. Go ahead and talk about it. I'm not even going to get specific. What do you? What is your impression going back and kind of create your involvement or your your impression it, it, of what happened? It, 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 it's a real long story. Yeah. I mean, it, and we it, don't need. Everybody knows the details. That's the good part about this story. We don't have to recount it in detail. But are you? Are you? Were you in favor of what happened at the time? And do you look at it differently now? This, it, it, it's a very long story, and, and I don't want to sit here and plug my book, but I'm going to because th- every detail is, yeah. is in my book when yep. it comes out. And th- there's stuff that people don't know. You could do two hours on it. Absolutely, really but there is stuff that people don't know because I was right smack in the middle of it. But I will tell you this, okay? A- and I will share something with you, and I don't even know if you're aware of this, but I understood completely 100% why Vince did what he did. A- a- and to this day, I stand behind him 100%. What's something that people don't know who are on Brett's side of this and think Vince did a horrible thing, what's what's a fact that, or an instance that kind of makes you feel differently? There, 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 there's a couple of things. Number one, Vince did everything in his power to come up with an alternate finish. Yep. Everything, and had everybody involved. That, that's number one. Number two, the, the question was never not trusting Brett the question was not trusting Eric Bischoff. Yeah. Okay, and all Vince was trying to do was protect his company and everybody in it. That that's all he was trying to do. Oh, okay, I'll take devil's advocate. You. Why lie to Brett? Why did Vince have to tell Brett at some point within 24, 48 hours of that match, Brett? I'm agreeing with you. Looked him in the eye. What you are now proposing is fine with me. We'll go with that plan. And after all Brett did for that company, okay. Vince went well, because I, I can tell you. Leading up to that, you know, at least a week leading up to that, Vince exhausted every possible scenario he could probably exhaust. Yeah. Brett shot everything. Brett yeah. shot everything yeah. down, and, and I don't want to just say shot everything down. Didn't want to hear it. He wasn't losing to Sean yeah. in Canada. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Okay, cut and dry. And, and, and I was there firsthand to, to to know the ideas and know everything Vince threw at him. Brett wasn't doing it again because of the history between him and Sean. Yeah. You know, but um. What it came down to was not trusting Eric Bischoff. Yeah. If, if Eric Bischoff would have went out on Monday Night Show the next day with, with Vince's belt, yeah. Vince was not going to allow that to happen. Yeah. So I will say, Brett gave Vince no other choice but to lie right to his face. Yeah. And Vince did what he had to do for his company and everybody in it, and, and I was a part of it at the time. You know? Did it hurt Vince? To do what he did, or was he so worked up by Brett's stubbornness? It, 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 and ripped, it, ripped, it ripped his heart out. Yeah. It, it, it ripped his heart out to do what he had to do. This, there's no question in my mind. After the incident, Vince walked into Brett's locker room to get what he had coming, mm-hmm. because he knew what he did, but he also knew he had no choice. But he, it, it ripped his heart out to, to do it.
do you think that Bret Hart took himself and his hero image in Canada so seriously, too seriously, that it made it actually difficult to reason with him? I, I, you know, it, it's funny because there were people at the time in the WWF that were laughing at Bret. Yeah. I mean, no question about it. Yeah. And, and the funny thing about it is he took it very seriously. Yeah. But the funny thing about it is I, I can look back now and I want somebody to tell me, okay, in the last five years or even the last ten years in this business, who has been even close to being a hero in the wrestling business. Mm -hmm. When you look at it today, Bret Hart was truly a hero. But how did losing to Shawn Michaels in Canada change that? It, it wouldn't, it was more, per that's where he used the hero excuse as a reason to not do a job to somebody who he despised. And that's, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it's not that he didn't want to lose in Canada because he was a hero. He didn't want to lose to Shawn Michaels because of what Bret knew Shawn Michaels represented to him. That's where I say, is he taking things too seriously? I Man, I, I, I tell you what, I don't think he was taking things too seriously because it meant that much to him. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 the moniker meant that much to him. And, you know, like I said, there are a lot of people that laughed at him, but I look back now and I'm like, Brett was a hero. Yeah. I mean, he, he really and honestly, truly was a hero. And th th when you look at the business today, th there's nobody like Bret Hart. I mean, I, I really believe that, you know, he stands tall and, and and he stands out perhaps more than anybody, you know, in the last five to ten years. I mean, I really believe that. But one thing I, I'll say, let me go, come at it from the other direction. I agree with you, Bret being a hero, especially in his in Canada and his, for everything that he represents. But the to me, what it comes down to is, yes, he was taking that very seriously and it meant a lot to him but by the same token I mean you've got to, I mean this is still you know Hero was a, a, a happy sideline to his day job which was being a wrestler okay. and at the end of the day you got to do what's right for business and he did not seem from what I've heard from numerous times we've talked over the story he was not interested in, or it didn't seem like, he was interested in seeing it from Vince's vantage point at all. It was all about where he was coming from and his point of view, and he wasn't willing to look at it from Vince's point of view because if he was, for a second, he could see mm -hmm. how could Vince let this happen. He was going to, he was, was going to WCW. Because when he Brett, had the belt. Brett was, Vince felt vulnerable at this point because it's, you know, people think about Mike Tyson happened. Right. Raw takes Vince over. Vince was vulnerable at he, this point. Yes, and he, and he got rid of Brett. Now, people on Brett's side say, wait a second, Vince told Brett to leave. I can't pay your contract. I'm, gonna, I'm going to default on your contract go negotiate with WCW. So people who are on Brett's side of this, one of the reasons they say is, Vince sent Brent o Brett away, he should have accommodated him. That's that side. The other side that you're talking about is Vince's side is feeling vulnerable. This is a time where anything goes. And Vince knows, because he played those same games with Jim Crockett Jr. with Survivor Series and Starcade in 87. Um, he knows anything goes and anything was going. So you're right, it, Brett didn't put himself in Vince's shoes. And that's why I think what it comes down to is two people, both with their own agendas, and the guy with more power won out. Mm -hmm. Vince ultimately had the power to pull the strings the to make what day. he wanted to happen happen. And the only way he could do that, the only way he could exercise his power, is by lying to Brett. He didn't choose to lie to Brett. He had to lie to Brett in order to protect the business. Whether he was right or wrong or paranoid or not, that's, that's where it comes down to. And that's where I don't really have a big fault with either side. It's simply the more powerful person won. Is that a fair way to maybe... I, I believe so. I yeah. think so. I think it is. And plus, also the 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 the, the uh, fortunate byproduct of it, it was that was the night that redefined the business. Yeah. As and far as the WWF was concerned. And it was a great opportunity for WCW had they chosen to use Brett mm -hmm. differently and had Hogan not played the politics that he did to sabotage things. That that it would have been. But you know that 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 goes right back to the bubble, yep. because mm -hmm. I'll never forget when the when when, when the Survivor <laughs> Series incident happened and everybody was talking about it. Yep. I'll never forget. You were there for that. Say I wasn't. I'm not going to owe you. Yeah. Okay, but I'll never forget going into the production meeting the next day, and everybody's talking about this. Yeah. And their first instinct was to sweep this under the rug. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I stood up, and this is, and I looked at everybody. I literally stood up, and I was like, "Are you kidding me? Yeah. 
Are you absolutely kidding me? This is, you've got what you wanted without even planning it. Yep. This is what everybody is talking about and you want to sweep this under the rug. So I mean, I, you know, and, and I could tell Vince listening and listening and listening and, and it was everybody against me. You know, and finally, that's when the you know Vince didn't screw Brett. Brett yep. screwed Brett. Interview came, yep. and that that was the start of it. I mean, that Whose was idea really was the start Vince, of it. Who was it? Your idea for Vince to sit down with Jr. in a setting not all that different from this one, and do this interview that was unlike really anything we had seen, where it was there. He was talking. You had to read between the lines. Oh yeah, absolutely. But, but it was all there. I mean, it, it, it was both of us. Yeah. I mean, it was both of us because I said, Vince, you've got. My, my point to him was. You are walking around the office with a black eye. Mm -hmm. You you need to explain to people why the boss has a black eye, if not for anything else. Yeah. So I mean, then you know, we talked about the format and how it was going to be done, and I, that right there is what started getting people on board. And people knew this was real they, because Brett left. Yes. There would right. have been no incentive for Vince McMahon. I mean, some people paranoid, you know, have conspiracy theories, but there's no reason for Vince to give Brett all this attention when Brett right. was leaving, other right. than he had to protect his belt exactly. in Vince's mind. That's what he felt. Yes. And again, it was it was highlighting what happened at the end of the pay per view, as opposed to sweeping it under the rug. Yeah. Because, as a fan, because I was watching, because I wasn't there that time, I, I was watching as a fan. I, my butt was in my seat watching Raw the next night, even if if you know I couldn't be, I was going to be watching Raw the next night because I wanted to see yeah. how were they going to deal with this how were they going to follow this up were they going because in my mind i was like okay they're probably going to sweep it under the rug because it obviously was not planned so sean michaels knew mm -hmm. and he's later he denied it at for years and now he's gone he's totally on record admitting it on confidential who else knew that there was going to be a swerve sean michaels vince mcmahon the referee who else I knew to some degree because in the booking meeting prior to that, we we talked about it. Yeah. But between the booking meeting and the show, Vince stayed a million miles away from me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know whether he was going to do it or not. Okay. You know, but um, I, I you know, I mean, I, I I that night, and I mean, for the longest time, I didn't know whether Sean knew or not. I mean, he yeah. man, he played great that he did. Yeah. Oh, I, I went over that, that tape like the Zapruder film, and uh, I, yeah. I was looking at Sean's reactions, and, <laughs> oh, and I picked it apart. I knew yeah. Sean knew <clears throat> from watching that tape, frame by frame, because of a contrived. Right. But he, but yet it wasn't. You know, that's just my interpretation. Other people, because Sean swore that he didn't know, because it was so important. He, as one of the boys, wasn't in on serving one of the boys. Absolutely. See, that's the point where Sean's head goes back and to the left, back. Man, I'll never forget the thing that hurt the most about that was again I understood why Vince did what he did and I, I, I love Brett. I mean I didn't think any differently of Brett. I mean I love Brett. You know, I had to wind up, you know, having a one on one with Brett and telling him, Brett, I, I support what Vince did. Yeah. I, I, I love you, but I would have done the same thing. But man, I'll never forget the thing that hurt the most that night was Mick Foley. Mm -hmm walking past me mm -hmm. and he looked at me and he said Vince he said you should be ashamed of yourself mm -hmm. and you don't understand coming from Mick yeah. Foley yeah. that was like coming from God now I'm still not sure with your answer did you or did you not know or have a strong feeling this was gonna happen we got you get we got to get the book Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a lot I didn't tell you yeah but we got to get the book gotcha. yeah, we got to get the book Owen Hart mm -hmm. Owen Hart um, I mean we talk about memorable nights in wrestling this is far and away probably the saddest night in professional wrestling. The worst night because it was in front of everybody. I mean, he didn't fall in front of everybody, but well, everybody. He did, but they didn't see. The arena crowd saw, but people on pay per view knew something happened. It was, I mean, just hor horrid, horrendous. What, looking back on it, I mean, there's been a lawsuit over it, all of that stuff, but a lot of people say Owen was put up there in an unsafe circumstance. I don't want to dissect the lawsuit because that's not. We don't have time or expertise to do that, but was there any malice behind the gimmick of Owen Hart that was meant to be making fun of somebody else where they lost sight of safety in order to try to? Prepare? I, I got I got to jump in. Yeah, because yeah. that that's so sad, man. Yeah. Yeah. If, if anybody knew how much Ed and I loved Owen Hart, I, I I can't even I can't even sit here and tell you because you're gonna think I'm saying it because of the way the guy did. You know, well, there, there's him. parents who love their showbiz kids, but they still put them in a bad right. situation. Right. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Did you guys no. you loved Owen, but did you lose perspective and put him in a situation? He, like that? He, here's a situation, and here's exactly how it went down. And this is what you know people don't don't know. Okay, this is exactly how it went down. 
Owen was doing the tag team with Jeff Jarrett. Okay, we had come up with the idea of Owen falling in love with Deborah because just the thought of Owen in love to us yeah, was hysterical. Owen, such a, yeah. Owen, was Owen such is a goof. Owen. Yeah. Yes. And, and the thought of Owen being in love. Yeah. And there's potential. Yeah. There's potential. Absolutely. I mean, we, we could have run with that for a long, long right. time and gotten a lot of entertaining stuff out of keeping them together, having that be just that tension yeah. there, but just the things that. Owen, the character, would have done if he had a crush on somebody. Okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah. how does that connect to? Well, so what happened Super was we, we we pitched him the idea, yeah. and Owen comes up to me and Owen says he goes Vince, I got to be honest with you. He goes, you might think this is goofy and this is corny and whatnot. He goes, but I'm, I'm telling you, my wife would really be upset by this. You know, my my wife Martha. Yeah. I know it's an angle. I know it's for. So once he said that, and the end. I mean, not even <laughs> no second thoughts. Yeah. But we, we had to come up with something because we had to progress the storyline. Yeah. So that's when we came back and we hit on with the Blue Blades a gimmick again. Yeah. And which we, he had and done in the late 80s. Which he had done in the late 80s. But he did it straight up just as a masked wrestler. Right. Yeah, without any character. Right. There was right. no character at all. Right. Right. It was actually an excuse for not having a character. Yeah. It was, right. okay, we'll throw him out. But this was going to be, you know, bringing the Blue ba Blades a, a back to life and doing it in a comedic way that we knew Owen would have been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Okay, Owen was cool with everything. He had no 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 problem with anything. He even said to me, he even said to me, he goes, Vince, I have no problem doing this, but at some point, I've got to win a title so people will take me seriously. Okay. And that's what he, his exact words, man. I said, Owen, cool, no why, problem. Why the Blue Blazer gimmick? Because the, the argument is that people make where they say there's some malice involved or deviousness behind it is superhero Owen Hart. Blue Blazer making fun of Bret Hart, taking himself too seriously as a hero, or oh that's Hulk the first time. That is the first because I was going to ask you where where right. was the malice coming that, from? And that's that's that's, that's the first time I've ever heard. That is the first time I've ever heard. Or Hulk Hogan making fun of the the old. Say Hulk your prayers, Hogan. take your vitamins. Yep. Yes, we did that in his promos because it just went hand in hand. But it wasn't yep. it, the character wasn't an excuse so to why, make why, digs at Hogan. So why the why the superhero gimmick for him? Why was that the backup plan? The same way of him. The same reason why he was going to fall in love with that. Was funny. Yes. Owen was a natural comedian. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, just like him falling in love with Deborah, we knew this blue blazer who's supposed to be a, a, a superhero is a stumbling, bumbling idiot. Yeah. Plus, couple that with the fact that everybody knows that Owen is the blue blazer. Yeah. And we were going to have Owen deny, deny it, it, deny it, deny it, yep. deny it. Them showing him footage, deny it. And getting humor out of that, yep. and and that was where that was where we really you know fell in love so, with the character and the angle. So the night he died, he's going to be dropped down. And I've heard different things on this, and you guys can clear it up because my memory might be right. Was he in a quick release mechanism so he could st fall down? Well, you, 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 you got to back up. You, 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 know, you got to back up first because Go ahead, again, yeah. this is what people don't understand. Yeah. First of all, when <laughs> when Ed and I wrote the show, okay. It was not written for Owen to descend. Mm -hmm. We never even discussed it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in my office and it's probably Thursday before the pay per view. Okay. I get a phone call from Steve Taylor, who is the director of operations, you know, set up the buildings yep. and whatnot. Steve Taylor has me on the phone and Steve Taylor said to me, he said, Vince, Sting's people are going to be at the pay per view. Mm -hmm. The people it, that lowest the stings, stings, the people gimmick, yeah, that lowest things, things. They, they're going to be at the pay per view. Is there any way we can do something at the pay per view so that they can show us what they can do? Mm -hmm. So now I'm sitting at my desk and I got my full man in front of me and I'm like, Owen. I mean, if and we had lowered Owen before. We had lowered him before, past. and I'm thinking if we can give Owen the grand entrance, I mean, again, just making him more of a star. Plus, you know? also, don't forget. It, it kind of went hand in hand with it because that was the night Owen was going to win the Intercontinental Championship. Mm -hmm. right, he was right. going to beat the Godfather for yep. the championship. Right. So it just it seemed like the pieces were coming together and to give him a grand entrance the night he was going to win his championship. He had done it once or twice before that as well, or even one, more once than he that. did it once before just that. Just with the Steve yeah. Blackman yeah. pinata yeah. game. But but the thing was, so you know, he says, so I'm looking at the former. I said, yeah, Owen. I said, you know, let, let's do Owen, not thinking anything twice about it. What people don't understand was it wasn't a part of the show. It, it was no big deal. Right. If Owen would have said at any time, I have a problem with this. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. I really, over and done with. The, the night of the pay-per-view, okay, after he had already done it during rehearsal, yeah. 
Owen came up to me and he goes, Vince, he goes, I, I just got to ask you one favor. And I said, what, Owen? He says, you know, I, I went through rehearsal and they lowered me. He says, um, he says, you have me coming in second. He said, what happens is it takes me a while to get out of my harness. If I'm in the ring second, you know, the Godfather will be able to beat me while I'm in my harness. Yeah. Could we just switch entrances? Yeah. Could, you know, could, could I come in first? So I said, Owen, you know, no problem. It's done. That was it. There was never, I don't want to do this. I'm yeah. afraid to do And plus the Deborah story of Owen saying he was uncomfortable with something. That's a testament to the fact that Owen knew done, if, he said, if he had said that. He, he knew that if he had a problem with it, it would have been addressed. And I'll say this. This is important. Five and a half years ago, I interviewed you for The Torch. It's the exact same story you told then. Right, absolutely. I mean, there's, I mean you know, people, you know, it's, it's like, that's exactly because, the same Because, you know, Wade, my, my rule of thumb is, and I, I, I will swear on a stack of Bibles, I never one single time asked somebody to do something they didn't want to do. But it, there, it, the story's it, out it there that Owen said he was at, he told people previously he's afraid of heights. He, his wife says she said, he said that. Well, you know what, but, so, but I, I'll tell you what. I, if he did, the relationship Ed and I had yep. with Owen, I, I, I cannot understand sitting here why he would have never said anything to us. He never would have had the I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying hesitation. anybody's lying yep. or he didn't say that, but he knows how we, what, we love the guy. And obviously, no matter what, your, the intentions of the gimmick are to have fun with it. Dissensions were being done regularly. Yeah, really Shawn Michaels did it. Right, mm -hmm. right. Sting right. had been doing it regularly. Right. It's done at NBA games. So and we had done it with Owen before as one well. One other time, yeah. yeah. And he was kind of dangling there and it right. was Right, and right. we did the pinion, the whole, yeah. So, the irony. Quick release mechanism. What, where do you guys follow? Is that out of your, is that? That's beyond our, yeah. because yeah. once, once it's, once it's in the format or once it's decided it's being done, yeah. then it becomes like up to like people like, Steve Taylor, people in operations, yeah. to arrange for the proper people to do that. And if there are any problems, believe me, we they never had any problems about calling us and saying, this is a problem. This isn't the this right isn't equipment, going we don't have work. it here. Right, okay. exactly. We need to regroup. We can't do it the way that you're thinking of. Yeah. We need to do it a different way. So, I mean, and we never got any wind of any sort of problem. Is knowing, I mean, you didn't, you didn't, Put him in a position where you had any say so over making him more safe. It was out. It wasn't your department, mm -hmm. and you put him in a position other people had been in before. Do you personally struggle with the fact that you know, hey, you could have said on the phone call, nah, nah, let's not. I mean, even if you don't feel like mm -hmm. you you should have foreseen it, does is that a really difficult thing to live? Well, with? you know what, I, I got to be honest with you, and it's twofold for me now. And you know, there there might be people that take objection to this, and if there are, I'm sorry. But first of all. It, it was really hard for me for a very long time to deal with it because it was my pencil that went on that paper. Yeah. And it was me who said to Steve Taylor without thinking twice, Owen Hart, okay? Yeah. And, and that haunted me for a very, very, very long time. But, you know, after becoming saved and after becoming a Christian, I, I now understand completely that on that day, that was Owen's destiny. Uh -huh. And it was meant to happen. It, it was meant to happen before he was born. And that, for whatever reason, that's the way it happened. And there's nothing I would have been able to do. There's nothing Ed would have been able to do. If it wasn't meant to happen, it wouldn't have happened. So, I mean, you know, the bottom line is it, it could be debated for years, but it, it was a situation that that was Owen's fate. And, and, and I mean, that was supposed to happen to, to own home. We, we can't answer why, but none of us could have changed it. Ed, you do you struggle at all with it? Um, I struggle with it in the sense that it's just how much I cared for Owen, how much I loved Owen. And the fact of the matter is that, like you said, it would have been as simple as going like that, and it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, he'd be here. But, you know, he'd, he'd but it's a matter of, it's, it's just, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Christian. Um, but I, I do believe in I do believe in fate and destiny, and I'm not saying that that necessarily was Owen's destiny, but it it, it it was. I mean, there was it just whatever happened, whatever events, whatever circumstances conspired together to to cause the, to to cause this horrible horrible tragedy. And the fact of the matter is that a, a very dear friend of mine that I love very much, you know passed away that night and I was there in the building and you know 
it's just it's a, it's a very difficult thing to even think about. But I, it's not like I'm I, I'm not particularly haunted with it because I know, like Vince said, there was really nothing we could have done. Um, short short answer on this one: mm -hmm. Should the show have gone on? Yes or no? And in a couple sentences, what mentality? Let, made let it me gone? bring a quick little insight yeah. sure. into this. Yeah, because we didn't even it. know yeah. it was chaos back then. And this is this is a thing too that a lot yeah. of people don't understand. When Brian Pillman died, yeah. we had a pay per view. Yeah. And I'll never forget the <coughs> Heart Foundation was working together. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'll never forget about 30 minutes before the show. I think they were opening a match. I think it was some kind of a flag match or something. But I'll never forget Owen called me into the locker room and said, Vince, come here for a second. You know? So I go in there and it's just him and I. And he goes, Vince, he goes, please tell me it's not true about Brian. Please tell me Brian's not dead. And I looked at him and I said, You know, Owen, I said, I'm sorry, man. You know, I, I, I didn't know what to say. I'm sorry. Owen laced up his boots and he went out there and he had the best match he could possibly have. Yeah. So was Vince right? Wasn't Vince right? First of all, under those circumstances, n nobody is, is going to be logical. Yeah. Th there is no right or there is no wrong answer. Do I think Owen would have wanted the show to go on? Absolutely 100%. Yeah. Because I know, like I said, when Pillman passed away, he went right out that curtain like a professional, and yeah. it must have broke his heart to be in that ring, and, and he did it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I know inside that that's what he would have wanted, and you cannot... It's, the you, one thing that I think people outside the wrestling business don't understand, and, and I mean, I, I see both sides of this argument, and, and I, so much so that I think either way is justifiable given the emotions, but people outside the wrestling business who are quick to criticize this, I don't think really understand the, the, the wrestling mentality that you're talking about with Owen that he had when Pillman died. And there is a, there's, there's a respect for the industry. There's and, respect and, for the business. And I think that people inside the industry did not continue the show in a way, they would not have continued the show if they thought it was disrespectful to Owen. People outside the industry look at what happened and they think everybody was disgusted with it 99% except for the person in charge who just wanted money. And, and I think, am I right in saying that other people behind the scenes, some agreed, some disagreed, but nobody felt going on with the show was in just an obvious disrespectful move for Owen? I, I don't recall hearing Even anybody Even those who thought the show should have been stopped. Because at the time, backstage, like I said, it was mass chaos. Yeah. We didn't know what happened because it happened in darkness. Yeah. We were rolling a pre-tape on the screen for the audience and the arena was dark. And he fell while that pre-tape was rolling. So even those who disagreed saw, with the decision weren't so. We just, didn't know. Yeah. But that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. We didn't know if he fell from 90 feet, yeah. or if he started his descent early and fell from 20 feet. Right. We didn't know. But if you he knew was he was alive. dead. And a match or two after the after, match or two later, before was, the end of the show, we knew. Yeah. But at that point, yeah. We had no idea yeah. what was going on. Because, I mean, when he was loaded we in an ambulance... Knew, we knew he was badly hurt, yeah. and we knew that he was loaded into an ambulance. And Lawler's language on the air was, you mm -hmm. know, it doesn't look good. I mean, it was the feeling was not good at all. Yeah. I mean... But let, let me put it this way. If you knew... I, I'm not trying to be crass with my language, but if you knew he was dead the second he hit the mat, mm -hmm. would you have... And, and you, everybody knew that. It was pronounced. Would you have had a different opinion on whether the show should go on? Would it have I think it would have been much more cut and dried. I think it would have been it would have been less confusing because, yeah. like I said, part of the confusion was we nobody knew what happened. Nobody knew for sure, yeah. you know, knew for sure what his condition was. Yeah. Um, once you knew, though, once if you we knew, know, like like you said yeah. again, if we knew the minute that he that he hit the canvas yeah. that he was dead, he had died. Um, I can just answer for myself, and I would say. I would say absolutely the show should have been stopped if he had if he had died right then and there. If the lights had been up, if everybody had seen it, yeah. if it happened and it was beyond a shadow yeah. of a doubt, uh, just my personal feeling, yeah. I would have said So do you think the chaos of the moment ex is, is enough of an excuse for people who thought this was horrible to, to go on with the show and that it isn't, shouldn't be looked back upon as a disrespectful uh, moment? I don't know if anything would be enough of an excuse if, if, if those people feel that way. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's not about making excuses. Yeah. It's about you have no idea what it was like yeah. to be backstage that night and never before that night did 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 it become so clear what a family mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what a brotherhood it was behind those scenes i mean these were a group of people who were on the road with we take for granted we're with every week you know for days um just 
huddled together in groups crying and you know and that's the next night as well and should raw just, have been canceled and a rerun aired in place or should they have done business as usual or was what happened the owen hart tribute show they which has been do, criticized they wanted to do business as usual yeah and i went into vince no. was talking to kevin dunn yeah and i went into vince's office and i heard the conversation and i said through tears vince if this show is in some kind of a tribute to Owen Hart, I am going home right now and I am not coming back. Mm -hmm. and, and I meant every single word. And you yeah. know what? If it wasn't, I would have left. And I yeah. would have been right with you. Because yeah. it's, it, it, it couldn't have been anything else. And what was that. McMahon's reaction when you said that? Did, did, had, he not thought, had he not thought of that before or had it been considered? You know, it, you know man, Vin, Vince was put in such a bad spot, that, that whole situation. And he wasn't thinking rationally. Yeah. But all that Vince knew was he had to be the guy that was still in control. Somebody had to remain in control. If Vince would have broke down, mm -hmm. the, the, the entire place would have broke down. Yeah. I mean, if Vince would have lost it, I don't know what Needed would have happened. Needed a captain steering the ship. Exactly. Were, were there any manufactured emotions on the air? That's been insinuated many places that there were wrestlers who went on the air who exaggerated how close they were to Owen in order to draw attention to themselves. And and I mean, is that? Did you sense that was going on? And obviously, there were genuine emotions on some people's parts. Was there ever a point where you watched some of the tributes and you said? Know, I, I don't know because all I could say is I was so. I, I was so upset, yeah. I wouldn't have been able there. to say one word. Yeah. I, yeah. They asked me to do it, and I was like, I... I, I. And that's the thing, everyone had a choice. Yeah. Nobody Everybody was strong-armed no, no, into doing no, anything. No, no. But what, what was really sad, what was really sad, and I don't even know if this is true or not, but you know, to read in one of the sheets that you know, one, one of the reasons you know, Eric Bischoff at the time said that we had done that was for ratings. Yeah. And I mean, when I read that, I, I, the only thing I could think of was, you know, shame on you. But that, that tells you in a nutshell, that's what the wrestling business is all about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what it's about. A level of about. cynicism and exploitation of anything. Is Absolutely. Yeah. All right. You guys made a jump that was one of the bigger stories of 99, the Monday Night War in full swing. You're at the center of it. And then here's a few key points that were going on at the time. <coughs> Eric Bischoff, WCW's falling apart. Raw has taken over. It is, there's little hope of WCW turning around just based on any signs. There's no signs of hope. Finally, the decision is made, in a nutshell, to get Eric Bischoff out. New corporate head comes in, Bill Bush, and he is trying to figure out how to fix this. And at the same time that's happening, SmackDown is added to the schedule. <coughs> You've t you are in a position now to have to do twice the work at a time of a very competitive environment. You weren't working 15 hours a week. You were working a lot. There's no consideration made towards your pay, and at the same time, WCW is looking for help. D kind of in a nutshell, re recap, all those things kind of came together at once, and all of a sudden, you yeah. have this opportunity, you first and then you, mm -hmm. in that order, to make a major shift in the whole wrestling industry, and it was a major, major change.